Hello, humans. I'm Kate O'Neill, and this is the Tech Humanist Show. It's a program dedicated to exploring how data and technology shape human experiences. Welcome back. We have been uh, in hiatus, and we're happy to be back. Did you know, by the way, that you could chat with a robot therapist? Did you? Would you? Would you do that? Are you curious about how the mental health field? like so many other fields has been digitized and what that means for your privacy and security, as well as for your actual well-being. Well, we're going to dive into all of that and more with our guest today. This program is brought to you by KO Insights, which offers insights to help make the human experiences of the future more meaningful. And this, as you may well know, is a multimedia format program, which means that it's being broadcast while you're watching it, and it'll also live on as an archive across multiple channels, so people can always find it later. Hello to those of you in the future from those of us in the past. And also, these interview shows develop into podcasts in the weeks to come. So I hope you'll subscribe or follow wherever you're watching or listening so that, this, uh, so that you won't miss any new episodes. I do want to take a moment and just give a little uh, notice that today we are going to be talking about human mental health and how data and technology can and cannot, or perhaps should and should not be involved. There is likely to be some general discussion of mental health care around self-harm. So I do want to just mention that in case it's a sensitive topic for you. So now to introduce our esteemed guest. Today, we are joined by Emma Vidor Highland, who teaches in the College of Media and Communication at Texas Tech University. Her research examines the relationship between health, technology, and culture. She is the author of Therapy Tech, the Digital Transformation of Mental Health Care. Her other research has been published in a number of peer-reviewed journals in popular formats, including Feminist Media Studies, Screen Bodies, and Sexuality and Culture. Emma earned her PhD from the Communication Studies Department at the University of Minnesota, where she also developed a concentration in bioethics. Her MA is in Media Studies from Pennsylvania State University, and her BA is in Communication from SUNY Geneseo. So audience, uh, please, Help us welcome Emma Bedore Highland. Emma, you are live on the Tech Humanist Show. Hello. Thank you so much for being here. Yes, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Ah, my pleasure. And I'm so glad that you could join us for this. This is such an important topic. Now, you opened your book with such an interesting case study about Abilify being granted the first ever approval from the FDA for an ingestible tracking device, something that people you know, kind of speculate is out there and, and can happen uh, with, with d drugs and devices, but it's an interesting reality. And yet there was no real data to support the claims that it would improve adherence. And there was real concern that it might foster paranoia. What made you feel like that story was the right place to open your discussion? And why is it so important? Yes, that's such a great question. I felt like by discussing the Abilify My Site case at the very beginning of the book, hopefully it would be a way for people who came to the research not really knowing what to expect, might get a lot of the arguments very quickly. Because what happened with Abilify My Site was basically the uh, the belief was that simply by inserting an, a, a tracking device within an antipsychotic medication, it would increase or improve medication adherence. And what that means is that people who are already prescribed Abilify um, would just for some reason decide to take their prescriptions more consistently simply because that new technology was embedded within it. So 
because there really was no data to, su to suggest that that was the case, um, I used that study to, or, or that case study to exemplify one of the ongoing tensions and discourses, which I discuss in the book, which is our belief in techno solutionism in the domain of mental health care services is a lot of the time unwarranted and more so reflects our aspirations and dreams about the ways that technologies could improve mental health care services, but really haven't been shown to be able to do that. And then throughout the book, I go through a number of other case studies and talk about other technologies, which um, demonstrate other problems associated with this belief that technology can help us. But the book is also intended to highlight the limits of what technology can do for us, as well as perhaps shining light upon avenues for which it might truly be helpful. And it's not just using resources in ways where they could be better um, used as I believe is the case with Abilify My Site. And even just lately looking at the data about Abilify My Site, I still haven't come across research to demonstrate that it has markedly improved medication adherence whatsoever, but it still continues to be prescribed by people because of our fundamental belief that technology and surveillance systems might improve mental health overall. That's a, such a great follow-up question that I should have been ready to ask and I wasn't even prepared to about whether, whether there was any new data about that. That's so interesting. But you not, know, you go ahead, please. Not that I could find about Abilify my site, but what I what I did find now we're we're living through the COVID nineteen pandemic still is that some of the one of the media interviews with the Pfizer CEO, um, so Pfizer produces uh, Abilify my site, has started to be recirculated, and some of the comments that the CEO made about um, ingestible tracking mechanisms in relation to Abilify was taken up by some anti-vaccine websites and um, being dispersed and circulated as in relation to COVID-19 vaccines. So I find that so interesting that um, people who bought into that story and that narrative that it was actually about COVID-19, which is disproven, he, he was only talking about Abilify My Site, might think it's okay to have tracking mechanisms in an antipsychotic but they get so upset about the possibility of a COVID vaccine having a tracking mechanism in it. So to me, that's just so interesting that people are okay with tracking people in one context because they've been diagnosed as persons with mental illnesses, but they're not okay with other types of tracking mechanisms for the more general public. Yeah, that seems like a great segue into your overall discussion of the idea of psychosurveillance. Uh, you talk about how we engage in surveillance of others' mental states and social media based on status updates and content they share. What, what is that idea and why should we be thinking about that right now? Yeah, so psychosurveillance came about because when I was in graduate school working on the dissertation that eventually turned into this book, um, I was thinking a lot about Facebook and I came across a, um, a, a leak, I suppose, of internal Facebook documents about the ways that Facebook was deploying algorithms to, in relation to the mental healthiness of their users. And I talk about that quite a bit in the book itself. But psychosurveillance is more broadly encompassing than just what Facebook does, because it, it also draws upon um, other surveillance scholars' works related to the ways that we learn to watch one another, not just when we are geographically proximate and close to other people, but also the ways that we can watch and surveil each other in online spaces. And um, of course, with increased thought and attention being paid to um, the global mental health care crisis, the fact that increasingly young people are experiencing mental distress and diagnoses of mental disorders, social media and similar platforms have become one way that we feel that we can um, engage in that surveillance of others' mental states. And it's sort of like that cultural truism when you see something, say something. If you see somebody exhibiting distress on a social media platform or any platform, you probably are going to feel obligated to intervene. And um, so, so psychosurveillance is, uh, is just broadly about the way that we engage in surveillance related to um, what in cultural studies, we sometimes call the psi disciplines or psi discourses, anything related to cognitive functioning and mental health. Yeah, it's interesting, too, that that um, makes me think about the uh, another topic in your book, which is around telemental health. And the the when you talked about, you know, the ways in which we sort of monitor one another, even when we're not when we are approximate or not proximate to one another. Um, that feels like a really relevant tie there. And it makes me think I, I, I had in my notes a mention that I, um, I keynoted a conference a little while ago around dental insurance. And I was kind of stunned at how big of a topic teledental healthcare had become, which kind of makes sense in the course of the pandemic that, you know, people aren't feeling confident to go be in person for their 
dental exam, but it didn't seem like something you could actually accomplish over an internet connection. But certainly telemental healthcare feels as if it is something that lends itself a little more readily kind of on the surface to that. But there are, of course, many issues that go along with that. What, what are some of those issues? What makes sense about it? And what are the issues inherent in it that we should be thinking as, as watch outs? Yeah, so I think a lot about telemental health care. And it's so interesting you talked about teledentistry because there are so many forms of telemedicine now, even telegynecology too, which is another thing which you would imagine you probably can't do <laughs> screen based, but it, it's happening. Um, but yeah, in terms of telemental health, and especially due to the pandemic, um, we saw so many people solely offering services that were screen based for good reason, right? To reduce the likelihood of spread of COVID 19. Um, a lot of my research, it's so interesting looking back at it now, my interviews with people who provide telemental health care were conducted prior to the pandemic. And um, it was really a challenge at that point to find research participants, people to interview who were advocates and supporters of screen-based mental health care services. They would tell me that uh, their peers sort of derided them for doing that because of this assumption that when care is screen-based, it is essentially diluted in fundamental ways that would negatively impact the therapeutic experience, um, which is completely understandable because communication is not just about um, words or tone or what we can see on a screen. There's so much more to it than that. But when interactions and communications are confined to a screen and seeing people vir virtually, you do lose um, some communicative information. Um, but one of the things I've grappled with and wrestled with as I wrote the book and subsequently since its publication is that I don't want it to ever seem as though I don't think telemental health care is an important asset. One of my critiques of telemental health care, well, I have a number in the book, but one of them is that a lot of the time in our discussions of telemental health care, we assume that people already have access to the requisite technologies and access to infrastructure that makes telemental health care possible in the first place, like having smart devices, even just uh, smartphones, if not a laptop or a home computer station, as well as access to a reliable internet connection in a place ideally at their homes, where they could interface with a mental health care provider. Um, so a lot of the discourse is not about thinking about those people whatsoever who, due to the digital divide or technology gap, even using technology, couldn't interface with a mental health care provider. Um, and then uh, some of my other concerns are related to the ways that our increased emphasis and desire to have people providing screen-based care also are transforming um, persons who provide that care, whether they're psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, licensed clinical social workers, into members of the digital gig economy who have to divide up their time in increasingly burdensome ways um, and work in ways where their employment continues to be increasingly tenuous. Um, and then relatedly, I am also worried about platforms, which um, are the places that people go to to access mental health care providers in the first place, um, one of those platforms, which I write about in the book, would be BetterHelp, which is gaining a lot of attention and has some really um, popular advertising campaigns right now. So I know a lot of people are becoming more familiar with the idea that these platforms exist, that they can go to, they can visit them on their devices, on their laptops, if they have those technologies, um, and then be connected with service providers. But as we've seen with um, what's happened with crisis text line, which I know we're going to talk about today, um, there are a lot of reasons to be concerned about those platforms, which become hubs for collecting and aggregating and potentially sharing um, user data. So I, while I think that telemental healthcare services are important, um, what I would like to see is uh, um, dedication of resources, not just to technologically facilitated care, but simultaneously um, using technologically facilitated care to simultaneously direct resources to in-person care as well. Um, we know due to the COVID pandemic, a lot of um, um, clinics that provided healthcare services for persons without insurance or who um, are living considered in poverty, who make less than $30,000 a year in their households relied upon in-person clinic services, and they haven't been able to get them um, due to their shuttering because of the pandemic. So I, I worry about the people who we don't talk about as much as I worry about um, the, the negative consequences and effects of mental health care's technologization. Yeah, you know, it, and I do want to come back to that crisis tax line, uh, tax line discussion in just a moment, but you bring up so many good points there that I, I want to circle back on. And one of them is about access, sort of generally. 
Um, and that was something that came up repeatedly throughout your book and also through the, uh, the other interviews you've had since publishing the book. One of the things I thought was interesting as I heard you say in a different interview relating to the problems of access where the interviewer asked, you know, is it, is it better than nothing? And you deployed one of my favorite mental models, which was both and to say, yes, it is both better than nothing. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't be demanding better. Um, I just love for, to offer you the opportunity to elaborate on that thought. Yes, absolutely. Um, that, that approach that it is better than nothing. And yet we can still do more, I think is so important when we talk about um, technology and technological innovations in so many domains and realms. Because yes, technologies can improve human functioning and hopefully we implement them in ways that facilitate our flourishing. But I also worry about this idea of resting back on our laurels or thinking that technologies don't create problems themselves. We know that technologies, when they are created by people, because they are created by people, they're imbued and embedded with our own biases or prejudices, even if it's not intentional. We have a lot of research about medical algorithms, for example, that shows the ways that when um, proxies are used in the coding of software, a lot of the times they are discriminatory, for example, against people of color. There, there was a fairly recent um, study, and I wish I, I could remember who authored it. I do know that Ruha Benjamin whose work I really appreciate, who writes a lot about um, technologies and race and discrimination, um, wrote, wrote an article inspired by the findings of that prior article about the ways that we don't often think about the ways that algorithms utilize proxies and how just histories of racism and discrimination can be embedded in them. So when people tend to think that technology can solve any human-made problem, I tune into that. And I've become really uh, <laughs> critical and analytical because technologies are not neutral whatsoever. 100%. That's great. You just ec echoed a recurring theme of the show. But you also get into um, the total lack of regulation around the tools and the concerns that that raises regarding data privacy protections and medical efficacy, as well as the whole discourse and construct around them revealing systemic or systematic erasure of non-white bodies from shared imagine. I'm quoting you here. I hope <laughs> the systematic erasure of non-white bodies from shared imaginings about whose mental health matters. I'd uh, love to, to have you elaborate there if, if you'd like. Sure. I mean, go ahead. Yes, absolutely. So the first part of what you were saying about the lack of regulation in this space is continues to shock me. Um, this research started more than five years ago now. Um, and at that time, when I was interviewing people working in various mental health technology fields, when I brought that up to them, um, people who are smartphone app developers, people who are advocates of various types of these technological interventions, they would say that they really appreciated the FDA's hands-off approach to regulating this space because they thought that the FDA was doing it intentionally to allow them to flourish and come up with um, new developments and just be a successful industry. Um, so as a result, what that means is that when things like these smartphone applications, which claim to improve user mental health, are made available to the public, it's on directly to consumer-facing platforms and markets like uh, the Google Play Store, the iTunes Store. And really anybody can sell anything that they want on those platforms. They don't have to undergo any vetting process whatsoever. It's really just survival of the fittest. If your application becomes popular and it's economically sustainable due to your model, maybe you have a subscription model, then it'll stay there. And it could be there for years and years. There are some applications in the mental health care space which have been there for years and years. But that's not the only way that we can address um, this space either. In the book, I describe how in the UK, the National Health Service actually has made a very concerted effort to regulate mental health care apps, in addition to just health applications more generally. So it is possible. And when I think to myself about why the U.S. approach has been so different than that, why there is no regulation, um, I somewhat cynically have to believe it's due to the desire to have like economic flourishing, um, see innovation driven by capitalism. That's my cynical approach. And until the FDA proves me otherwise, that's kind of what I am going to stick with for my belief about that. Um, I know that you had some other elements to your question as well. I can't remember what they were right now. Yeah, no, I I, I think you're getting, you're definitely dealing with the regulation aspect. The, the um, discourse around the systematic erasure of non-white bodies feels like it, it ties into this too, because it, it is definitely, you already spoke about, you know, the, the idea of like algorithmic bias, but it feels like this is a, 
a more systemic bias that's saying, you know, the, these um, regulations or, or protections don't need to be extended to people who don't have access to sort of more private forms of treatment, right? Like it's it's one of the things we see across a lot of the industries and fields that we we look at tech impacting that there becomes this sort of privilege of, you know, you can you can either be part of a pool of people who are trading data for broad access, or you can be someone who's paying a premium and keeping yourself a little bit out of that pool. Um, and with mental health care, that seems like the, the implications of that are pretty staggering. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I, I love everything that you just said as well. But one of the things I talk about in the book is this framework called like a technological imaginary. And it's sort of this like imagined space where people who are responsible for generating code and algorithms think about ideal users, especially when it comes to wanting to make a service for a consumer facing platform like mental health care apps as another really apt example. Um, in my interviews, I would talk to people about who they thought the target users would be, the target demographics, if they knew anything about their power users, they did. So they always told me, but over and over, it was always predominantly white, young women. Mm -hmm. um, and that was also reflected in the design of the technologies themselves, I would say. Um, so that would involve me looking at what the technologies offered, um, things like how did the guided meditation sound, what kinds of voices were apparent there, um, what type of user might want to hear a voice like that, or what type of user might not want to hear a voice like that, um, because of an incongruency between their own identities and lived experiences and the voices being imbued in these meditation tools, for example. So um, when, when I asked one app developer, for example, why did you pick this female, white sounding, Caucasian sounding voice? Um, he explained it to me as because they know who their power users are. He did not want to create any friction between their user experience and what they experienced uh, using the tools in relation to their identities. So very much so the people creating these tools are aware of who is using them. And it does, again, tend to be young white women. Um, more broadly in the book, I discuss that incongruency between the claim made by people who support technological innovations in mental health care services saying that they believe it'll increase access to mental health care services more generally. Yet at the same time, the reality is that that same demographic young white women tends to be the same demographic who already receives the highest levels of quality care um, for mental health care services. So there's an incongruity between who the imagined user is, claims about these technologies, increasing access to mental health care services, and as you were alluding to, this idea of responsibilization, um, which is a term I also use in the book. Um, and I draw from theoretically the work of um, Michelle Foucault, who writes about neoliberalism too. So the way that I use it in the book, and I try to make it theoretically very accessible, is to say that there is an emphasis when we talk about neoliberalism upon um, taking responsibility for yourself, um, anything that could be presumably within your control. And in this day and age, we're seeing mental health, one's own mental health being framed as something that we can take responsibility for. So in tandem with this rollback of what would ideally be large scale support mechanisms, um, local mental health care centers and facilities to help people in need, we're seeing an increasing emphasis upon these ideas like use the technology which you can get for free or at low cost to help yourselves. But at the same time, those technologies literally don't speak to and don't reflect an imagined user, which would be that of the person who we know in this country needs interventions most badly or most strongly. Yeah, it, it's it's so interesting. Like, it, it comes back to it feels like this this fundamental question that you raise in the book, and that you know you write in the book. The question we should be asking is not how we might create technologies capable of solving the mental health care crisis, but rather what do mental health technologies reveal about beliefs and practices related to the self, medicine, and culture, right? And that I mean, it's such a great construct overall for us to question, but what is the right question then for us when it comes to technology and mental health with so many people in need of care? And it, and it feels like the, the, the attempt to unpack this is where we start to examine, you know, what beliefs we hold about um, how to take the, what we owe to society and pay that forward in, in, in ways that, uh, that imply a political um, view, imply a political, a political discourse and, and an economic discourse, as you said, and, and that that sort of ties into, you know, I, I use the phrase all the time, the economy is people, 
because it feels like we don't in, imbue that often enough in our economic constructs of, of what we value and how we make valuable decisions. Um, but yeah, what, what is the, the right question? How should we be asking where and how technology could actually be helpful in the mental health field? Or are there just too many risks and issues wrapped up in delivering mental health care through technologies? Yeah, I, I reflect on this question all the time. And there, there are two questions which I'm starting to arrive at. Um, the first is that I think we need to be more specific in particular, and by we, as if I'm making these technologies. I mean, we, the, the we people probably. who make these technologies, <laughs> the collective we, um, need to be more specific about who we are saying can benefit from these tools and not just speaking as though there's a homogenous population in this country or globally, because a lot of these tools are used internationally that could benefit because that's not quite accurate. We know that high quality mental health care services involve considering things like people's identities, um, their culture, their race, their ethnicity, their gender. There's so many dimensions to identity. So we kind of need to stop pretending that a discourse of inclusivity is possible for an algorithmic tool, which is programmed only with certain parameters. Um, so I think when people claim that or like in media discourse, I often see these tools being um, described as like the therapist in your pocket or the doctor on demand. Well, the doctor for who? Whose needs are they actually going to serve? So I think we could uh, spend more time being critical when we see these like overarching blanket statements, which are not completely accurate and actually cause harm for people who are left out of the equation due to their um, programming. And the second idea I, I've been tossing in my mind more recently um, is that I think that technologies can help in cases where there are immediate dangers. Like if you see somebody upload a status or content which says that there is imminent intent to self-harm or harm another person, um, I think... I'm maybe maybe 10 years down the line, I will regret saying this, but I think that there is a warrant for an intervention in that case. Um, but we also know that there are problems associated with the fact that those cries for help or however you want to describe them are technologically mediated and they happen on platforms because everything that happens via a technology generates information, generates data, and then we have no control depending upon the platform being used over what happens with that data. Um, so I, I would like to see platforms that are um, made for mental health purposes or interventions to be held to held accountable in the fact that they need to be closed circuits. Um, it needs to be that they all pledge not to engage in any data sharing whatsoever, um, not engage in any monetization of user data, even if it's not for profit. Um, and also, of course, to have very clear terms of service that make very evident and easily comprehensible to the average person who doesn't want to read 50 pages before agreeing, because we assume that they're in need if they're using these tools already, um, that they won't share data or information. Yeah, yeah. It, it's such an interesting point you make, too, that I, I feel like, you know, you said you'll, you might regret it in 10 years, but it feels like you, you're very clear that you're, you're talking about constraining this to this the scope and sphere of mental health, right? We, it, it so easily feels like it could escape the bounding box and go, you know, into predictive policing. And it could be into sort of the, the thought policing of, um, of science fiction and, and not so science fiction uh, at this point. But, but it's clear what you're saying about the opportunity to, to provide services to people who are in need at that moment and, and be able to, to use the services that that are uh, available in ways that are protective and are and don't cross over boundaries. So it does feel like it's the moment to to begin the crisis tax line discussion. This has been a, sort of a hot issue lately in the communities that are adjacent to mental health, data ethics, and privacy. And uh, that is the uh, the topic of the crisis tax line tax line suicide hotline, which. Um, uh, and the for-profit company Loris and Dana Boyd, who is the founder of Data and Society, who sits on the board of Crisis Tax Line, and at some point, you know, was part of making a deal with Loris.ai, the uh, for-profit company which makes customer support software to grant them access to data that uh, Crisis Tax Line was, or let's just agree that we're saying CTL for uh, <laughs> brevity purposes. Um, was collecting from these crisis interactions. So 
that um that whole construct feels like it begins to be very problematic as it relates to your notion of responsabilization. It, it's problematic as it relates to a lot of what you're talking about, especially as we get into this area of predictive sort of interventions. Um, but specifically wanted to call out in, in Dana Boyd's blog post about this, she writes, uh, she didn't want the service to be needed. She said, the fact is that it, that it is stems from a system that is deeply flawed. If we could build tools that combat the cycles of pain and suffering, we could pay forward what we were learning from those we served. I wanted to help others develop and leverage empathy. And I just, that's where I wanted to feel out your take on how this bumps up against responsabilization and other themes in your book, in your work. Yes. I, I respect Dana Boyd's work so much. I just find myself very much in disagreement with her, her take on what has happened here. So I wanted to say that I think she has done so much important work mm -hmm. before addressing this more so, but that quote that you pulled from her blog post, and it's a very long blog post. I, mm -hmm. um, every time I read it and reread it, I notice new things in it that I, I, <laughs> I want to think about and communicate about, um, I, I think that that quote again that you pulled really demonstrates this idea of neoliberal responsabilization because what she wrote reflects the fact that again in our current social and economic world we don't have the widespread support mechanisms for people experiencing need and um, crisis tax line when it comes into fruition in 2013 and it says we can meet people where they are by allowing them to communicate via text when they're experiencing crises. Um, I think that's a really laudable thing that was done and that people thought it was an intervention that could save lives. And we, and based on the research um, about crisis text line from external researchers and also their in own internal researchers, we know that that is the case. Um, but I also, what I, what I disagree with Dana Boyd about is that, there are no other options. Um, I also feel as though, along with continuing to develop and improve Crisis Text Line's offerings, um, one of the other opportunities could have been to try to dedicate funds and fundraise, for example, um, seek funding externally to um, put resources into community development in ways where we could put people face to face with care providers and not use a system like Crisis Text Line. So for people who might not be aware, Crisis Text Line doesn't put people using the services even in contact with um, professional mental health care workers. Instead, it is people who often have no training or background in mental health care services and instead go through training and serve as volunteers to help people in moments of dire need and crisis, of course. Um, in therapy tech, I also describe how I, I perceive that as a form of exploitative labor because in the case of crisis text line, um, although in the past there were discussions about whether or not to provide financial compensation for volunteers, they ultimately decided that by emphasizing the sort of altruistic benefits of volunteering that that sort of payment wasn't necessary. And then I compare that to even Facebook's problematic compensation of its content moderators. And the fact that those content moderators actually um, filed a lawsuit against Facebook. And um, al although it hasn't been disclosed what the settlement was, at least there's been some acknowledgement that they experienced harms as a result of their work, even if it wasn't volunteering. So um, I, I do... <sighs> I do take some issues with crisis text line. And then in relation to this idea of neoliberalism and responsibilization, again, I think that crisis text line is not the ultimate solution to the mental health care crisis in this country or internationally. And crisis text line has also created international partners and affiliates. And so I think that we should uh, be cautious of when we, when we or Dana Boyd, for example, truly believe that technology is the solution to the crisis. Um, because it's it's absolutely it, it's not and it doesn't have to be and I and I I worry about like the sort of fatalistic determin determinism types of rhetoric that make it seem like technology is the only way to intervene because I, I truly believe that technology has a role to play but it is not the only way. Yeah, well said, and it does feel like too there's a there's an exploration to be done and an unpacking about the uh, what what I think comes across in Dana Boyd's blog post that feels like a sense of obligation with the data that's collected to future individuals, to the, the future world uh, in terms of using that 
data, which is obviously data that represents human trauma um, at people at their lowest moments. Um, but using that data in ways that can uh, potentially unlock clues that help us solve future mental health problems. And I, and I suspect that most people would have no problem with the idea of doing that as it relates to the scope and sphere of the collection of that data. If someone's calling in in a moment of crisis, then let's help solve uh, future crises near and dear to that moment. But I think there is something that feels a little crass about taking it and then commercializing it for customer support data and, and customer support usage. And I, is it, do you think that that is the, the crux of, of the, the dilemma here, that simply the, the, the distance of remove from, from the trauma and the context in which it was collected? Or do you think that there's more to the, the, the tension around simply the collecting and aggregating of that data and using it in a mental health construct to begin with? I think that the reason this story has become so newsworthy is because something feels so icky and unethical about the monetization of the data. Although Crisis Text Line um, and Dana Boyd have have um, really emphasized that they, there has been no exchange of data since 2020, I believe. Um, but the Politico investigation does reveal that there was a sharing of data in exchange for financial support. And I think um, that is why this has gotten so much attention because this idea of data sharing or, or even not even with a for-profit entity like Loris, which uses the data to improve its customer service algorithms, which which is another reason why so many people find this relationship so offensive. Although if, if we actually look back at the relationship between the two companies, they were headed by the same CEO, Nancy Lublin, for some time. So that's really kind of how it developed. Um, but this idea of not having control over one's data when it's about something so sensitive and stigmatized like mental distress and mental disorder is a broader issue. And I'm, and I'm glad that in some ways this story has become so, uh, so popular and so many people are aware of it because my concern goes above and beyond just the monetization. Um, the idea that people don't understand that um, platforms conflate notions of providing um, um, or, or asking potential users to agree to their terms with what we differentiate from informed consent to have one's data or information studied and researched and shared beyond what we believe just our interactions are within the ecological system of the tool or platform that we are using. Um, so that is my broader concern. And then also, as I was saying earlier, this this idea that technology, of course, can be helpful when it comes to providing in the moment um, interventions for people who are experiencing suicidal ideation or an intent to harm themselves or others. But I still, I'm still unsure how I feel about trying to make predictive algorithms in any way that might try to make predictions about when people are likely to harm themselves or others simply because of how easy it is to use that type of software for things like predictive policing. Um, I write in the book as well that former President Donald Trump wants to harness internet data and what people do on the internet and social media to try to stop um, people from violent behavior before it starts. So it's very much a slippery slope. And that's why I find um, data sharing in the realm of mental health so so difficult to really <laughs> to critique because of course I, I want to help people, right? I never want sure. people to just think that I don't want to help people, but I'm also concerned about things like privacy. No, but I think it's so it becomes very clear when you consider, and I have great respect for Dana Boyd too, that if someone who has as much of a, a, a credible background and, and has done so much for uh, literally data and society, um, who had, could make an ethical slip up like this in, in the best of conscience, you know, trying to do the best of work for, for people. Uh, imagine, you know, who, someone who doesn't have that much of a conscience guiding or doesn't have the same values guiding the work, that it becomes very, very simple to take uh, the models and the, the data that's collected and, and use them in, an, in, a, uh, in a way that, that becomes even more distasteful <laughs> to say the least. Right. More yes. harmful. Of course, yeah, and and in Dana Boyd's blog post, um, there's a there's a sentence or a phrase like um, if something about just regretting the fact that she voted 
to support the partnership between the two entities. And so uh, as you were saying, Dana Boyd is so well respected. Um, and so it, it makes me nervous for the rest of us and the right. other platforms. Yeah. Right. Exactly. But I want to veer a little bit off of it. Thank you so much for, for weighing in on that. I think it's an important discussion. I think it's one that, that people are really paying attention to right now. And it's so timely to have your, your perspective on that. But I also wanted to weigh in on, or have you uh, talk a little bit about, you know, you mentioned uh, at, at one point in our early discussion on Crisis Text Line about how it's volunteers and that you wrote in the book about volunteering as well. Um, what did you learn from, from that experience? With, uh, it was with seven cups of tea, right? Uh, what did you learn from that experience that informs how, how you approach the crisis text line issue as well as other issues around how we model mental health? Yes. Uh, so basically, I I underwent training for a separate, totally different entity called Seven Cups of Tea, which is both a smartphone app as well as an internet accessible platform on a laptop or desktop computer. And Seven Cups of Tea's training compared to what I know Crisis Text Line volunteers have to go through is incredibly short and um, I would characterize as unhelpful and inadequate. And um, I found that I describe in the book, I found the 10 minutes of training um, to be really terrifying because if you are volunteering your time to offer your services as an untrained mental health care professional in a space where people are coming to communicate with you, send you messages anonymously because they are experiencing mental distress. Um, that's, that's kind of a, a terrifying. It really is just 10 minutes. Oh uh, yeah. For, for me, it took 10 minutes. Now I did the training a few years ago as I was writing the book, but for me, it took 10 minutes. I can't imagine it would take anybody more than half an hour, honestly. Um, and so the types of things I learned from that training were how to uh, reflect user statements back to them, how to uh, listen empathetically, but also not provide advice or tell people what to do, um, because you never know who's on the other end. And so, you know, would I have, would I do that training again? I don't think so. Honestly, even though I think I learned a lot um, from it, I don't think I would do it again because I'm so much more cautious these days about the ethical Im implications of messaging with other people experiencing distress. But um, at the time I conducted the research, I went ahead and I started to volunteer on the platform. And um, a lot of the messages I got um, were or, or the the requests for messages that I got were not from people experiencing mental distress necessarily, but from people who just wanted to chat um, or people who kind of wanted to abuse the platform. Um, I have some examples of that in the book, and they're somewhat graphic in nature, but people would just kind of abuse whoever was on the other end if they didn't want to provide the commentary or feedback that they were looking for. Um, so yeah, I, but even though I only had a few experiences, which I describe in the book, during which I felt as though I was genuinely communicating with, with people experiencing mental distress, I, I still found um, those experiences to be really difficult for me. Um, that could be just because of who I am as a person. Um, I, I'm sure there are people who find uh, providing those sorts of volunteer labor really um, rewarding and enjoyable, and they might feel like they are really getting something out of it and helping other people in need. But one of the things I found was that, or what I realized or feel and believe is that my volunteering on the platform was part of a larger scale um, initiative of Seven Cups of Teas to try to differentiate between who would be willing to pay for services after I suggested them to them because of my perception of them experiencing mental distress and those whose needs could just be satisfied by like being mean to me or maybe just having their emotions reflected back to them through superficial messaging. Um, this so ties it, into my, my uh, subhead theme in my outline of people are not okay. Like it's really even more true right now during the pandemic. But, you know, I, in my research for this, I just kept running across stories about, you know, men creating AI girlfriends and then verbally abusing them and, you know, horrific stories like that. I mean, people are not okay. So on yeah. one hand, it makes it more important that services like this exist. And on the other hand, it makes it harder to imagine how it could possibly be beneficial to have volunteers with 10 minutes of training uh, operating them. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I very rarely felt that I was truly able to help people in need. And therefore, I, I feel worse about myself for not being able to help people in need as though it's somehow my fault related to this idea of 
individual responsibilization, me with my no knowledge or, or maybe slightly more than some other volunteers of how to provide adequate care or interventions for people, um, feeling like I, I couldn't help them um, as, as though I'm supposed to be able to help them. Um, yeah, it's just, it's this really strange oxymoron that we don't have these large scale support mechanisms offering interventions and care, but instead we rely upon the general public with really no knowledge or expertise to provide care. And it's, and a lot of us buy into that precept. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's a bizarre model and it doesn't make any sense. And it, it, it also feels like it comes back to that both and right. We want to hope that it's better than nothing. And also my goodness, we have got to do better than this. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Um, this, the, the next thing that I'm thinking about as you're talking about this is that there is this, this quirk about the space that I work in at this intersection of technology and humanity is, is learning. Uh, one of the quirks I encounter is, is learning every day the various ways people articulate that relationship or think about that relationship. And most recently, I've, in, I've in, uh, encountered the name, the term humanization of technology a lot from, from companies looking to bring me in to speak or for advising services. And I have just found it such an interesting term because in the nuance it, it, that it suggests almost like adding a human face to tech. It's like, you, you know, you sort of picture you create a robot uh, that's for, for interacting with kids and you humanize it by giving it a fun, loving, cute, cuddly face. Um, that feels to me almost manipulative, but it's something that kept coming back to me a lot while I was reading and, and learning about your work. The, the notion that we are taking technological interventions and humanizing them in some construct. Does that resonate with you as well in the, in the research that you've done and the work you've done? Absolutely. Um, a lot of the tools and technologies and platforms involved imposing human face or human characteristics and attributes upon AI and algorithms, absolutely. Um, of course, thinking back about the volunteering that I did on Seven Cups of Tea, I know that all those communications resulted in aggregated, analyzed, potentially shared data, but me as a person providing service services, even though the service was just me reflecting people's emotions back to them, gave it a truly human face. Um, there's also so much research about the ways that making technologies more personable or personalized um, results in increased feelings of positive affect and liking of them. Like we know in general, for example, people think of Siri or Alexa as their friends and they call them their little buddies. So in the mental health care technology space, um, one of the things that is done so often is to make cute, cuddly looking creatures sort of the personifiers of the application or technological intervention being offered. Um, whether it is something that is AI based and a therapeutic chat bot, or whether it's just sort of like a personification characterization of like a more general mental health and wellness app. Um, we love to give human attributes to these technologies. And, and again, it, it imbues them with a sort of sheen of objectivity and neutrality to think that they are cute and human like and personable. But at the end of the day, what we're communicating with is not a cute little uh, robot looking thing that has feelings, but instead it's really just an algorithm. But this also makes me think about the fact that in the book, I described my interactions with what I thought was a chatbot. And it turned out to actually be a, a team of people pretending to be a chatbot, too. <laughs> <laughs> sort of a reverse Turing test. Exactly. And I found I found that even more alarming because um, one of the benefits, of course, and I mean, this this I agree with is that when you're communicating with a technology, you don't necessarily have to worry about human judgment. But that's only if we don't think about the fact that our communications become aggregated, analyzed, and shared data. Um, it just feels like nobody's ever going to know what I'm seeing to this technology. But then when those expectations are violated and you find out that there's really a person on the other end, then it becomes much clearer the role that people have to play in making these tools. Yeah, I wrote a piece uh, a couple of years ago that made it into my book, Tech Humanist, that was called, Should a Bot Have to Tell You It's a Bot? And there was in that piece an exploration about what happens when it's the reverse, when it's the sort of movie phone Kramer. If you remember from the show Seinfeld, there was an episode where Kramer had gotten a new phone number and it was one digit off from movie phone, which was the then, you know, dial by phone service where you would find out about movie listings. They got so tired of trying to tell people it was the wrong number. He just started trying to impersonate movie phone like, 
what number, what movie would you like to see? And <laughs> that sort of model uh, people don't realize uh, very often is actually how many chatbots are trained with humans kind of impersonating bots until they can sort of get a script down, you know, sort of repeatable constructs that can become a script, can become a workflow. So it's very interesting that you actually encountered that in the process of doing your research for this yeah. book. <laughs> <laughs> what a quirky uh, part of the work. Uh, you know, it's it's interesting too, but thinking about how uh, all of this deploys in the employer space. Uh, I think one of the topics that seems really potent right now is the concept of mental health as it relates to work. And especially amid the backdrop of the pandemic, the great resignation and this, you know, kind of overall growing awareness of mental health needs. It feels very telling what the approaches are that various employers are taking for dealing with their employees' mental health needs. And of course, what kinds of technologies they're deploying. It seems like a lot of it might start as wellness incentives, perhaps, but end up introducing new kinds of surveillance into the work. I was wondering if you have been encountering that and, and are documenting that, researching that at all. I absolutely agree with everything you just said. Even in my research for Therapy Tech years ago, when I was interviewing um, a psychologist who also served on a board for a very popular smartphone application, um, she revealed to me that um, their board of directors was looking into partnering with insurance companies because um they weren't finding just individual subscribers to be a sustainable economic business model. And instead, employers, of course, even prior to the pandemic, were very much concerned about um, the economic costs associated with a whole spectrum of mental disorders and illnesses. We knew that every year prior to the pandemic, they were costing the global economy billions of dollars. Um, so now that the pandemic has, of course, exacerbated experiences of mental distress and diagnoses of mental illnesses and disorders, um, it's unfortunately, uh, to me, a predictable outcome that we would see a lot more partnerships between employers and these um, technological service providers who claim that their technologies will improve user mental health because fundamentally work is about making money. And yes, that is very much connected to health and wellness overall. Mental health is absolutely part of overall um, healthiness in general, and they should be treated as such and fundamentally interconnected. Um, so at the same time, it also makes sense that managed care would lead to including dimensions of mental health care services. I just am concerned when it comes down to things like asking um, plan holders to utilize wearable technology, surveillance and tracking oriented technologies. Um, a lot of people don't feel like their privacy or data privacy is at all violated by uploading things like their number of steps taken in a day or how much they work out to insurance companies. But um, we're not at a point yet where we see predictive analytics or um, smart data being generated in relation to mental health and mental disorders. But we are seeing a lot of studies trying to make predictive algorithms um, using things like biodata, trying to say that the way that you interface with your technologies and your smartphone can be used as a predictor itself. So algorithms in those ways of things like depression and anxiety, um, using the technologies embedded, um, automated sensors, for example, in your smartphone to see if you're not leaving home and then to suggest, for example, algorithmically diagnose people with anxiety or depression because they're not leaving the house. Um, so I worry about what the end game is going to be in terms of trying to diagnose people with these interventions. Um, yeah. And, and as I write in therapy tech, people have been trying this for a number of years with increasing success when it comes to doing things like aggregating people's public social media posts and trying to make predictive algorithms to diagnose them with things like ADHD, depression, anxiety. Um, and, and these aren't things that we talk about enough in relation to insurance companies and cost savings initiatives. But I, I do foresee um, insurance companies trying to find uh tracking mechanisms to assess a patient or individual subscribers' mental healthiness as well due to the economic incentivization. And it seems like it's not limited to the employer space either because it's, it's so many, uh, so many wellness related opportunities that, that tie into, like I saw Hilton has, is uh, deploying a bunch of fitness themed rooms to try to tap into the wellness tourism market. So, you know, you get into, um, when does that start 
dovetailing over and when are we going to see insurance companies you know want, need to know that you're you're getting you're going to get a discount because you're booking with Hilton and you're going to use their wellness themed rooms and so on. Yes. yes. No, I I hadn't <laughs> seen that, but that that is absolutely something that <laughs> is alarming to me. Uh, there's plenty to be alarmed about, but we <laughs> let's try to we'll try to lighten it up in these last couple of minutes that we're, we have here. Uh, you know, this of course is the tech humanist show. Um, do you uh, feel like you identify with the idea of tech humanism? Like in what way do you feel like you are a tech humanist? Like what brings you the most hope about how uh, tech can actually empower or, or be of use to humanity at scale? Yes. Um, thank you for asking that. I do <laughs> actually identify as a tech humanist because I am optimistic about what technologies can do and offer and provide and the ways that they might be utilized to enhance human flourishing, especially in health spaces and including the mental health care space too. Um, my concerns are not about technology. Is technology good or bad? I think technology can be made in ways that really does help us. Um, a couple of things I mentioned earlier during our conversation are that my concerns are about what happens to data after you generate it. Technologies can be made in different ways where the data being aggregated about you is not being shared or sold or monetized. Absolutely, I think that people do feel empowered by using technologies which increase their own self-knowledge. And even something from logging on your phone or an app which will track for you how many steps you take in a day. A lot of people love to do that. Um, it's just that when it comes to where that data and information ends up and how it is used and how it's used in ways that people don't understand, that's where my critique comes in. So I, I absolutely do think I am a, a tech humanist. <laughs> I just also think we need to be realistic and not we, just everyone in general about what technology can do and the ways that technologies are deployed, um, which might cause us harm. Yeah, absolutely. And that's right in line with tech humanism. So we're in good shape there. Uh, we, one of our other recurring themes, though, and you've touched on this a little bit, is that of seeing a possibility for a brighter future if we work for it. So in what way are you hopeful for the future? And where do you think our efforts and resources should best be directed? Yes. Well, what's happening with Crisis Text Line right now, actually, as horrible as it is, makes me um, a little bit optimistic about uh, the general public thinking about privacy and ethics related to data protection regarding things like mental health care and our the, the widespread belief that technologies might improve global mental health care. Um, and I have seen in my research a couple of legislative bills being introduced or discussed, which um, would increase um, regulation about data ethics and protect protections. I'm thinking about Kristen Gillibrand's bill um, so that there would be more oversight of how data is stored and shared if shared at all. Because I do think that these are things that people who utilize platforms of all types aren't thinking about as they utilize them because there is this conflation of agreeing to informed consent as opposed to a technology's uh, terms of service or a user agreement, um, which we saw happening with crisis text line. So I, I am optimistic about positive changes happening and happening soon, largely because of what happened to crisis text line. Yeah, the the visibility it makes the the imperative uh, happen there. It feels like it's, it Absolutely. makes it more likely that we're going to direct the right attention to it. Mm -hmm. Well, Emma, thank you so much for being here on the show, for talking through these thorny issues uh, so eloquently. The book is Tech Therapy. Uh, it was, I think we just had it up on screen here. Thank you, uh, producer Jupiter. Therapy Tech, actually, I had it backwards. The Digital Transformation of Mental Health Care. So please go find that book and read it. It is really wonderful. Emma Bedore Highland, thank you so much for being here on the Tech Humanist Show. I appreciate it. Thank you. you so much for having me. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for listening to the Tech Humanist Show. If you're looking for more, you can find more information about the show's guests and links to their projects at thetechhumanist.com, where you can also find more episodes, or you can subscribe at iTunes or wherever you get your shows and podcasts. I'm Kate O'Neill. Join me again next time for more about how data and technology shape the human experience.